Welcome, Mukund. Dr. Mukund Rao is an ecoclimatologist who researches and inter the interactions between climate change and natural and human ecosystems. He received his PhD in 2020 from Columbia University. His research was based on uh, uh, investigating flooding in Brahmaputra and Indus rivers in South Asia. He's currently an NOAA Climate and Global Change Fellow. NOAA is National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is under the US Department of Commerce. Welcome, Mukund. Thank you, Ajay. Before we get into the flood situation in Assam, which is getting worse, could you briefly describe uh, uh, your research? And you know, you specifically did it, did it on flooding on Brahmaputra. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, my research expertise is in the field of dendrochronology, which is the study of tree rings. And how this works is that as trees are growing every year, they're in influenced by the environment or climate around them. Generally, trees grow more in wet years and less in dry years. And in some regions, especially in, if we move away from regions that have a lot of human influence, like in the upper reaches of the Himalayas, you can find tree, some trees that can be hundreds of years old. And so then we can use some of these trees to take really small cores from the trees to study the pattern of rings in the in the in the wood of these trees without damaging the trees and then look at these patterns of wide and narrow rings to then infer whether climate in the past and the present how is that how has that been changing are are things becoming wetter or drier uh, as time progresses and so in the study that we did in the brahmaputra there were basin we were able to use tree a uh, network of tree ring sites across the eastern Himalayas to then understand how climate in the region has been changing. And we combine that with mod climate model simulations of what we expect will happen in the region with climate change to bring together this more holistic picture of regional climate and how it's both changed in the past, where we are currently, and how it's going to change in the future with climate change. And the, the short answer story to that is that we expect, or and we are already seeing it right now with the floods that that we're going to have more years with extreme rainfall, and we're also expecting better better conditions than what when we've seen historically over the past few decades. So the method you briefly describe essentially looks back, you know, way back in time. You know, mm -hmm. uh, centuries, you know, six to seven centuries. So how does it have a bearing on the current situation? I mean, is it purely based on computational modeling mm -hmm. uh, simulations? And uh, to what level of accuracy we can uh, rely on these findings so that we can be better prepared? So what the trees do is that they give us an estimate into the past and of course, they're filtering this through their own biology and not just climate, but other things in, impact the trees as well. But we can make models between how much the tree is growing in a given year and what is the amount of rainfall or what's the amount of water in the river. And we can do that for whenever we have observ observational records or from gauges of rainfall or gauges of river flow to compare that against tree growth. And now when I talk about the observation record, actually a major limitation of the observational record where we have been using scientific instruments to measure temperature, precipitation, or stream flow is that we have been doing that in a systematic way only since the 1950s or 1960s, if we're lucky, and in many places only from the 1970s or 1980s. So this only gives us 30 or 40 years of data. And so when we're trying to come up with estimates of what is a 50 year flood or what's a 100 year flood, if you only have 30 or 40 years of data to calibrate our models of flood risk, we're a bit limited by this short observational record. So one of the ways we can get around this is to use this information that we can get from the rings of the trees that 
that can grow live up for up to 700 years or even longer in some some places and each year as the tree is growing it's recording information about the environment that it's growing in and of course these are not perfect recorders but statistically in the model that we developed the rings of the trees can explain about 50 percent of the variance in the instrumental data so they're really good at telling us how is whether the mean conditions are wetter than the nor wetter than normal or drier than normal and in some cases even pick out historic years that we knew were flood events from documentary evidence and then we can see that the trees actually were growing more in those years so overall they do a good job not perfect but they're amongst the best resources that we have now as you know you know the situation in assam is getting worse the flood situation now uh, you have also uh, shared your research findings with uh, uh, bangladesh i think that's also one place that you researched on um, have you um, what was their response and have you has this your findings been um, noticed or you know uh, have you been approached by the indian government bodies you know related agencies who should be dealing with this situation what was their response yeah i have not unfortunately been in touch with anyone in the 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 local urban or local agencies in Assam or the Indian uh, Indian agencies. I have not been in touch with them directly, but I definitely agree that there's we need to get this research and other research that's talking about how the flood risk in the region is much higher than we know we think it is, and we can already see direct evidence of that. Yeah, we definitely need to dis disseminate this information more. Right, and uh, there are other, you know, Indian, uh, you know, research uh, centers, you know, who work on this specific area. Has there been any response from them? Because your paper has come on nature, and you know, there have been significant writing also about it. So, has there been any attempt from Indian scientific community? to reach out and you know extend this research and then you know find a, an application in in say assam for example yeah I, I, there are colleagues of mine who are from the birbal sani institute in lucknow who are working on doing similar work in the tributaries of the brahmaputra like the tista and in sikkim and other rivers in the region and many of these studies are also finding similar results that the present uh, flood risk is being underestimated. And so there's more or, uh, scientists, both in India and elsewhere, are working on these topics together. And uh, coming to the dissemination of this information, um, of course, there is, you know, there the are government agencies, then there is, uh, there are scientific, uh, you know, groups, research groups, and you know, the community in general, but then on the other side is also the general public, right? Now, this, the kind of research that you do, an intense, you know, complex research, which gets published in top scientific journals, will definitely reach certain audience. But this should also reach the general public so that they are empowered to tell the government, look, there is much happening. We need to look into this. Why don't we revise the way we do or relook at the way we do things? So what do you think could be done to make this reach the public? I mean, could there be another version of the paper that is generally understandable with good graphics, storytelling in science, all that combined, so that people are empowered? I think the last part of what you mentioned, I think having better storytelling in science is something that is really powerful to reach out to the general public. And especially with trees, I feel like it's something that is very intuitive for many people to understand because many of us have looked at what a cross section of a tree looks like. Maybe a tree fell down in a storm and you can actually see the rings of the trees and how they're growing more in some years or less in some years. And so many people already have this conceptual image of what trees and tree rings look like. So I think storytelling in the form of living through the life of a tree and thinking about how it's growing more or less based on the environment around it 
and then how we can use that information to understand about clim understand more about climate change i think like having some kind of st uh, storytelling approach i think would be really powerful to disseminate this information better um, you know, uh, your research was done in 2020, a couple of years back, let's say three, four years back. I mean, that has generated a data which led to, you know, the analytics part of it and then the, you know, the conclusions. Now, how I, does it corroborate with the current, uh, you know, happenings? To what extent is, you know, can we find a kind of a, uh, how much can we rely on that uh, data? and the predictions that forecasting that came out of it to what is happening currently. Yeah, so it's in one of the, the main findings that we had was that what we expect as the, or we should be expecting more, more intense flooding and more frequent flooding in the Brahmaputra river basin. And this, even in the last three or four years, we are seeing that happen. But at the same time, that a lot of this is so my the study that I worked on was more on the natural sciences side of things of how is the climate changing. But in reality, floods are not just caused by natural factors of heavy rainfall, which is definitely a prerequisite, but it interacts with social factors of where do we have high amounts of urbanization where water cannot. Uh, water does not seep into the ground and it accumulates. If you have more built up areas, you're more likely to have flooding in those areas. If you have poor clean or if the cleaning of the stormwater drains has not been done in some time again, all of these factors can also add on to the or compound the flood risk. So having the heavy rainfall is one part of it, but then the, so the urban planning aspect of it is another really important factor of the contributing to floods. And so generally, one of the things that we always see is that the worst floods tend to occur in urban areas. And this is because of this interaction between our urban infrastructure. That's not really how natural ecosystems behave because we have built many cities right on the floodplains of rivers. And then of course, when the river floods, it's going to flood the city. And so the the natural side of things is on, is one aspect and then the urban side of things is another or the social side of things is another aspect but another thing that we said in our study is that with climate change because we are emitting more carbon dioxide we are emitting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere what this does is it's kind of super it supercharges the earth system or the earth's climate system where when we have precipitation we receive more heavy and more intense precipitation. And so a lot of our urban centers were built using this principle of stationarity in the sciences where we know that maybe this is how normally floods occur. And if we if we built at this elevation or this distance away from the from a river, because it's never flooded in this region before, it's not going to flood even in the future. But with climate change, this assumption that what has happened in our memory is our understanding of climate is not really true because we are seeing events that we have not experienced in our human lifetimes, be it floods in Assam or floods in Kerala. It's still, it's the same idea that we have not seen such floods in recent years, but we have also not experienced the climate itself has changed. So what we have seen in recent years is not really a good baseline for what we expect in the future. But the trees in this sense can play a really valuable role because our instrumental records of climate are really short. So if you have only 40 years of data to make simulations of how often do you get an extreme rainfall event, you're limited by only having 40 years of data. But if you have a longer time series of data, even if we are undergoing climate change, because there's a lot of variability in the climate system, if you go back with 700s of, 700 years of data, in a statistical framework, you're more likely to fill out the extremes or the tails of the statistical distribution. If you have more data to calibrate 
flood risk model so with 700 years as compared to 40 years. So the longer paleoclimate or past climate information that we're getting from the trees helps us helps inform us about current flood risk. And then we can also look at earth system models or these are mathematical models that predict how the climate is going to change in the future if we commit if we continue to emit CO2. And so we can combine information from these models that are predicting or simulating future climate with more CO2 and more warming and combine that with the historical information from treatings and all of these, both of these sources of information are telling us we should prepare for more intense rainfall. But then on the social planning aspect of this, we, we, we need to prepare for more intense rainfall and, and be ready for that. Um, so, I mean, if I understood right, you know, a better simulation and a better forecasting is uh, possible with a larger data set. Yeah. You know, so there is, uh, which eventually points to better preparedness, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you also mentioned about urbanization, you know, uh, there has never been a time, you know, real estate development slowed down. It's been always on the rise. That's one thing. Uh, has there been any attempts based on the research findings by the local or government authorities, you know, as some state or, you know, the national government in general, uh, any attempts to curb or control or regulate the urbanization space, specifically on the basin? I, yeah, I don't think there's been, I don't, I'm not really aware of any, these recent changes in policy and construction on the flood floodplains, for example. But yeah, I, I, I hope that we, we take some action and say we leave some distance from the river and don't build right next to the river. And I, yeah, I don't know about exactly if things are uh, changing on the policy front, right? Policy now. front, okay. And uh, another question that comes to mind is, you know, you mentioned climate change. Now, this is correlated, right? I mean, it, it's like a feedback loop. I mean, you know, there is definitely there is, you know, human or man-made uh, interventions that's happening dam, constructing dams or hindrances on the, you know, across the flow of the river. Um, has that also been factored into your study to uh, do the forecasting? In this particular study, we were we had we were not looking at the uh, we were talking about climate change, but we were not looking at the impact of dams. And this is because the if such example, China is working on building a dam in the upper part of the basin of the Brahmaputra, but that dam does not really affect summertime flows as much because summertime flows are coming from the monsoon but a dam on the upper basin uh, on the on the tibetan plateau would affect the winter time and the or the dry season flows that are not that are coming mostly from snow melt or base flow of the river so in that sense it does not really affect the summertime but the winter time flow is really important and so we should not discount that because a dam that would divert the flow in the winter is going to have ecological implications for the river. And especially for Bangladesh, it's the winter time flow that, or because Bangladesh and even parts of Assam, like in the uh, West Bengal and the Sundarban Delta are really low lying regions. And the reason that the salt water remains in the Bay of Bengal and does not intrude into the land areas because we have these really large river systems with the Brahmaputra and the Ganga and their tributaries continuously dump, uh, putting fresh water out into the Bay of Bengal. So if we reduce flow in the winter, when, this, when the flows in during the year at the lowest point, then we allow for salt water to intrude further inland and get into the groundwater aquifer systems so there's an there's an impact of dams in the winter time season and uh, then the second part of your question about changes in the basin climate change 
is one part of it where it is impacting the monsoon system and making it uh, wetter. But there's other impacts of climate change where because temperatures are warming, they're melting more of the glaciers and the snow melt, snow that falls in the winter also melts more early in the season. And so we're having some additional input of water in the river also from the snow melt, the extra snow melt and glacial melt that especially during the springtime in uh, May, May or so, in early May or so when the snow is beginning to melt can combine if we get early and seasonal, unseasonally heavy rainfall early on in the season that can combine with, um, rainfall can combine with the snow melt and the glacial melt to also cause flooding. And another third complication in the region is that there's a lot, a lot of deforestation also that's happening. And deforestation also it can cause more extreme flooding because if we replace a forest with, or if once we deforest the landscape, then when we do get rain, a heavy rainfall, which happens every year because we're in the, one of the wettest regions in the world, instead of that water entering the, so infiltrating the soil and then flowing out really slowly back uh, downstream into the main Brahmaputra and into the Bay of Bengal, that process happens really quickly if you do not have trees on the landscape. And so when you deforest, you get these very rapid extreme flows instead of if you had a stable forest ecosystems, then they, a lot of the trees and the roots would soak up a lot, a lot of that water and then it would eventually make it down into the river valley, but not as rapidly. And so deforestation also can exacerbate exacerbate the flooding conditions because all of that water reaches downstream much faster than it would if you had forested landscapes or intact forested landscapes. Thank you, Morgan. So coming to the last uh, question, you know, year after year, it is the story of pain and loss and struggle. It, it's getting worse this year. Uh, what do you think, what should be done immediately? You know, the immediate steps to be taken at, so that at least next year, you know, we won't have the same, you know, painful story happening all over again. Yeah, I think a couple of the immediate things that we can do is we actually have pretty good lead times of weather forecasts that are telling us that this is how much rainfall we expect. But I think the dissemination of that information does not really reach people in many cases that we we'll, so we need to be evacuating or leaving regions preemptively and for example in other in other states especially in orissa after a lot of the the cyclones over the last 20 years the disaster risk preparedness system has actually become very well developed where even with a few days notice we're able to move people out of dangers way really quickly and so we need to work on building such systems where we might be able to have evacuate people from regions that are expected to flood. And we also need to have better local maps of which are the regions that are most vulnerable to be, being flooded because generally everywhere in the region is low lying, but some regions are still more vulnerable than others. So we need to have combined the information of the, the forecasting with uh, better preparedness on the ground. Thank you, Mokun. Thank you very much. I, I we firmly wish and hope these recommendations and suggestions and you know, a lot of effort put into your research and the entire team worldwide uh, is taken note of and something is done to really reduce the suffering of the people. Thank you, Mokun. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was nice, lovely speaking with you.